Welcome back to the Conflict Hotline. Welcome to Dr. Nagler. Dr. Nagler is Professor Emeritus of Classics and Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley, where he founded the Peace and Conflict Studies program. For 25 years, he taught popular courses in nonviolence, meditation, and a seminar called Why Are We Here? Great Writing on the Meaning of Life. He's an internationally recognized nonviolence expert and the author of several books, including award-winning Search for a Nonviolent Future. He has consulted for the U.S. Institute, Institute of Peace and many other organizations and is the founder and president of the Meta Center for Nonviolence Education in Berkeley, California. Thank you very much, Sigal. Hi, Michael. Hi, Mickey. How are you? It's great to have you here. Thanks so much. Very good to be here. And uh, thank you for sending us that scenario. It was very mm -hmm. lively and fruitful. And mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any reflections as oh, you were yeah. watching it. It was lively and fruitful, and it's also very real. Mm -hmm. And it uh, touches on something that I think is probably the biggest problem in the progressive movement, the peace movement uh, today, which, I mean, I don't want to use a fancy word like self-purification, but we have to get our message clear. Uh, needless to say, this actually happened. Uh, yes. I was uh, consulting with the students around this whole issue. But it takes us back to Seattle, 1999, and it takes us so back to the Haymarket riots and on and on. And I think the one thing that Dana could have said that she didn't reach out to is, look, I'm not saying that my philosophy is right and yours is wrong. All I'm saying is we'll never know which one of us is right, which one of us is wrong, unless we get to play it out in a clear, consistent way. So whenever you have a movement that's mostly nonviolent but partly violent, it will be perceived as a mishmash at best or as a violent movement at worst. That's part of the training of human consciousness and human attention in this culture. So I've even made up a law, kind of tongue in cheek, but my hope is to get the Nobel Prize and to do that, you have to have, be the author of a law, right? So Nagler's law goes NV plus V equals V. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not always absolutely the case in the mathematical sense. Uh, someone pointed out to me that although the flotilla did erupt in violence on the Mavi Marmara when it was uh, when the uh, IDF soldiers commandos were landing on it. There was some violence there. Still, the overall impact of that event was startling and eye-opening, and you could say it had a nonviolent effect. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that this is absolute, but I would say that suppose those sailors, those passengers on the Mavi Marmara had not reacted violently, I think the impact of that episode would have been much greater by virtue of being clearer, by being one thing. So what, what do you think is the thing that makes nonviolence so powerful? Hmm. I actually believe that nonviolence draws its power from negative energies in a funny way. If uh, I'm faced with a situation and some anger comes up and or fear and sometimes greed, I have learned to look upon that as just pure, just energy mm -hmm. without any moral you know, connotation to it. Now if I convert that anger into something creative and positive, that very same energy, which was quite considerable. I mean, look at the world. You see how much damage is done by anger. The same amount of good could be done by compassion, sympathy, whatever that anger turns into. So we have this expression uh, in connection with uh, the wonderful behavior of the CIA and other uh, security agencies. They, they use the term blowback to describe the fact that whenever they try to do something, it blows back in their face. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're using wrong energy. They're using negative energy. Mm -hmm. If they could use positive energy, it would become blow forward. Because everything mm -hmm. that you do would be multiplied in the direction that you want to go, even though you can't see mm -hmm. exactly how. So, so I, I'm understanding um, what you're talking about in terms of the inner sense of mm -hmm. power of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. What I am really curious about is 
how do you think that it creates an effect? Mm -hmm. That kind of power. Why yeah. is it? Why is nonviolence having an mm -hmm. effect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in a funny way, nonviolence is having an effect the same way that violence has an effect. You know, Hannah Arendt said that violence is very powerful to change things, but it'll always change things to a more violent world. Mm -hmm. And nonviolence will do the opposite. Now, I'm going to get uh, technical on you for a second here. And this is something that uh, we really haven't known about until very recently. It was only discovered in the late 1980s in Italy. And that is the fact that in our central nervous system, in our brain in particular, there are specific neurons, the evolutionary purpose of which is to detect the intention of another person. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you're threatening me, which so far hasn't happened in our long friendship, but just for theoretical. Ah, no, nah, didn't work, big <laughs> Nicky. Let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's say that it worked. And so, okay, this fear comes up, hypothetically, and I decide I'm not going to act on this fear. So it's not like I choose to be compassionate, I choose to be understanding, but just in that act, say, I'm not going to let this drive me. Like what Martin Luther King said, I'm not going to let anyone bring me down so low as to make me hate him. Mm -hmm. There's an image of who I think I am and who I think we are and the unity that I believe in between us. I'm not going to yield to fear. Now you're expecting me to. You're projecting something into me which you expect is going to be reflected back as a fear reaction. But it isn't. Instead, whatever that turns into, compassion, understanding, I'm actually triggering that response in your brain. The, is it like the mirror neuron? This is mirror neurons, this mm -hmm. is what I'm talking about. And I want to emphasize that the mirror neurons are just sort of the physical equipment that has been brought into being to facilitate a non-physical force, what uh, Gandhi called a living power. Mm -hmm. So even, and uh, King said this really beautifully, even among people who may not be here perceiving directly, visually, what happened, somehow, and this we have to believe, but we cannot yet explain, somehow that positive energy becomes part of the ambience mm -hmm. and it makes things better. And it's because we, as human beings, <clears throat> we understand each other so well on this primal level of is it hate or love? Is it, mm -hmm. is it unity or disunity? Everyone is built to pick that up. Mm -hmm. And when you reflect back a state of unity, it automatically registers. Now, I'm not saying, <clears throat> and this is important, especially for liability reasons, I'm not saying that it'll work. Yes. You know. You and know. It's, a, it's a big question of what it means for something to it, work. Exactly. It's and like, I, what are the consequences and yeah. at what cost? And, at, and on what level? Yeah. Because I can do something that won't work in the sense that I end up getting hurt, I end up getting killed, I end up not convincing the other person, still that positive, constructive energy has gone out there into the onlookers and I believe into the world at large. Yeah. You look at, um, I suddenly forget, uh, Rachel Corey. Oh my gosh. Um, yes, yeah. she died. Yeah. And uh, the reverberation mm -hmm. of that yeah. was so much more powerful because it was that particular yeah. kind of death yeah. and not some and other not, kind yeah. of random death. Not yeah. a random death, not a passively accepted uh, kind of suffering, but something that I'm going to take this risk. Uh, in my book, Search for a Nonviolent Future, that was written before Rachel mm -hmm. died, I cite the example of Maximilian Kolbe, mm -hmm. now known as the Saint of Auschwitz, who, yeah. who volunteered to die yeah. in Auschwitz for another prisoner. And in Auschwitz, the mentality was save your own life no matter what, you know, survive yeah. till we get rescued. And he just reversed that. He said, I'm going to lay down this thing which everybody is clinging to for the sake of a fellow human being. Yeah. And we now know that it literally hundreds, maybe thousands of people survived. Because, because of acts of kindness. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I think You're that so uh, this you. is about the time that we have here. Is there uh, one last sentence that you want to say before we conclude? Uh, I would like to encourage people to explore nonviolence. I think it's the one thing that is really going to 
rescue our situations individually, socially, internationally. If we can help you at the Meta Center for Nonviolence, we would be more than happy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming. This Very was a welcome. pleasure. The skeleton is